This is message number 12 in our series out of the book of Colossians. And, you know, this section that we were looking at last week, which is uh, the first chapter, verse 15, the verse that reads, Who is the image of the invisible God and the firstborn of every creature? Is so... This section that goes from verse 15 to... I'm going to say verse 19, is very rich and deep in giving us a portrait, an image, an understanding of the relation that Christ has not only to the Father, but to all of creation. So I don't want to do the typical, you know, drive by real quick and take off, which is sometimes what I do. Let me just say the first stanza of this passage, which I just read, relates to Christ in creation, beginning with the claim that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. We looked at this, the image of the invisible God. And maybe the only thing that I didn't point out in this, we'll call it A, I I split the verse into two parts. This part here, who is the image of the invisible God, is A, and this last part, would be B, but you've got, kind of interesting, you've got two concepts that are actually juxtaposed. The image, which is the Greek word icon, which is the visible, the representation, and the invisible, the unseen. It's kind of interesting that, as I said, we tend to read and study, but sometimes you can look at strange ways that the Apostle Paul or some of these writers of uh, Old or New Testament will use devices that some of them are mnemonic devices, others are these word plays that may not actually be that obvious to us in English, but when you're reading it in the Greek, or if you were hearing it in the Greek, would be immediately recognizable as a word play. So it's kind of interesting that you've got these two words, which I've circled in blue, which basically are juxtaposed but they speak volumes of who is Jesus as the image, the icon of what is the invisible God, the unseen. So let me just kind of bounce back into the text again to say I'm pretty sure, and I may have referenced this last week, but I'm pretty sure that when Paul was writing this, who is the image of the invisible God, firstborn of every creature, there had to be a desire to almost reach back and call to memory the passages out of Genesis. And why do I say that? Because I equally believe that this 15th verse opens up a little bit, for me at least, of the understanding of what kinds of heresy and controversy were being promulgated at the church at Colossae. So it would be fair to say that starting at verse 15 and through verse 19, Paul is painting a picture for these people to understand the supremacy, the greatness of Christ, who is over all, above all, to make sure that he really drives home the point. You're going to basically be reading in 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, just a few verses. You're going to be reading essentially a driving point that he is in all, everything. He's essentially putting emphasis on, and let me read so it it becomes so abundantly clear, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created, all things, my emphasis, that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities. This opens up an interesting gateway of questions because we know, for example, dominions, principalities, powers, those are also terms used to describe in Ephesians 6 the powers, the invisible powers that we'll call them are the subcategories that sit right under the devil, those cosmocraterists, those forces at work, but created, very important words here, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. There we go again. All things, 
were created by him and for him. So you really get the sense, the emphasis here is all things, in all things, by all things, all things to Christ. They're all connected there. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Do you think that Paul is trying to say all things? (laughs) Can you hear me now, right? And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. So it seems in just these few verses there is a push to convey a certain message about all things connected to Christ. Now, it is very clear to me that if you take these passages we've just read and you kind of superimpose the text of John 14, you get great clarity that Paul is not preaching some different doctrine. Let's read John 14 so I can just make sure we understand. Remember, when we read things that are repeated in the Bible, that is sound doctrine. So somebody might say, well, you know, where's Paul coming up with this stuff? Well... All you got to do is read what Jesus says. John 14, and beginning at verse 8, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words, the rimas, that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you that he, believe, that, he that believeth on me, the works that I I do shall he do also. The greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father." So it's very, very clear, and that's just one of many examples where Jesus is saying he and the Father are one, that in asking to see the Father, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, which comes back to our text, who is the image of the invisible God. He is the representation. He is what we cannot see in God the Father came in the flesh, which is why the incarnation is so important And so let me start by talking about a few words in our, well, actually one word in our text, which probably I will spend the bulk of the message looking at. This word right here, firstborn. So actually I'm going to take a new page. The Greek word prototokos, which is being translated firstborn. That is, if you have a Bible like mine, you're going to see a number to the right side of firstborn, which is 4416. That number, for the sake of those new viewers, is, because I'm reading a King James Bible, is linked to the Strong's Concordance, which is the concordance for the King James Bible only. If you're reading an NIV, don't go trying to use the Strong's Concordance. It doesn't match up. So, in the Strong's, you'll always see me put a little S there, 44. 16, and that word is made up of two Greek words. So let's go with, um, and let's put this in phonetical, uh, phonetical way so you can see. So first, the first half of this, protos, you actually have proto, but I'm putting it the way it will read in, in the Strong's, which is foremost, before, beginning, chief, best, all right? And the other, this last part here is 5088 in the Strong's. This comes from, I'll write it in English for you, or phonetically for you, tico or ticto, which would not look like that in the Greek, but it doesn't matter, which means to, to produce, to plant, to seed, the verb to seed, not seed itself. Seed is a different word in the Greek, but to seed. So this word here is very important. 
for our understanding of the text. First and foremost, when we start investigating a word, we do what we always do, which is we go back and we look at how far back the word historically has been used, what are the sources. Sometimes we have to go outside of biblical writings and go into places like Plato and other historical bodies of work. But here we know unequivocally that this word, prototokos, is rare outside the Bible and does not occur before the Septuagint. And I'll repeat for the benefit of new listeners, the Septuagint is the Greek version, uh, Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek about two to 300 years before Christ. So we have this word appearing. Putting it together is being translated firstborn. But it is not necessarily the chronological order of birth when we talk about firstborn. In many cases, specifically dealing with this word, we're going to be dealing with concepts of primogenitor or birthright. So these one, we're going to split prototokos into two camps. One is chronologically by birth, the firstborn child, firstborn, the first of a family, the first of its kind, and also firstborn as a privilege, as a status, usually a double portion inheritance, as well as other blessings that carry with it, we'll call it other connotations within, especially within Judaism. So if Paul only had the idea of birthright here, it would carry metaphorically for Christ in a special and distinctive salvific role. First of his kind, and I need to kind of qualify this, Jesus being the first of his kind, I don't think in the history of humankind we've had the birth of a child where the child was all man and all God. I don't think we've had first of its kind where a virgin gave birth to a child. There's a lot of first of its kind. So when we talk about this prototokos, I also want you to think not so much, I don't want you to attach it to this, but a prototype. Even though I don't want you to attach it to this word, the concept should be understood as the first of something and other, other things will follow after its kind. So you remember back there in Genesis when you're reading and it says, and something after its kind, and it beget, and after its kind. We tend to detach these concepts, but in reality, nothing has changed because we, we have these terms, in especially the King James, where it says beget. So-and-so begat, and after his kind, or cattle, animals, after their kind. So it's important to understand that this word being used towards Christ has, it will carry some other meanings with it. The New Testament use is not as, as, as much as the Old Testament. I believe in the Septuagint alone, there are over 130 occurrences of this Greek word, prototokos, of the 133 uh, or 130 occurrences, 79 of them occur between Genesis and Deuteronomy in the Pentateuch, and 29 of them occur primarily in First Chronicles, which is the genealogical record. And you know when you're reading the genealogical record, for the most part, it is speaking of that natural birth, if you will, the production of a child, the child being born, naturally in that natural way and not in any other specific way. But as I was going to say, if Paul only had the idea of birthright, it would be carried here more in a metaphorical way. We can also understand some of the thought process in the verbiage of verses 15 and 16 if you kind of leap a little bit to Jewish wisdom. And Jewish wisdom talks about wisdom as being created. If you've read Proverbs 8, talks about how wisdom is created, that whole chapter. It almost is like if you read Proverbs 8 and you kind of see how that passage depicts wisdom, then it would be fair to say that the one who possesses the wisdom had the wisdom to create all. 
So it would be kind of ludicrous to insinuate that Christ himself was created when I just finished reading to you that it was for him, by him, in him. I mean, you can't miss that. So you'd have to be wearing almost blinders to misinterpret this passage and make Christ a created being. You'd have to almost willfully do it. And this is my, uh, I'm going to just take a sidebar, it is my pet peeve that people tend to do that without looking up supporting text and doing a little homework. We pull one thing, like pulling a rabbit out of a hat, and there we go, and that becomes doctrine. So it's tenable to speculate that these verses were penned by the Apostle Paul to kind of begin warding off some of the errors being propagated at this church. One, specifically, that there would be a great gulf between an infinite God and finite man, and it is completely tenable to speculate or hypothesize that these people were preaching that that gulf was bridged by angels or something lower or less than instead of looking to Christ. So it's, it, you can kind of see that as we get into the body of the text, there'll be things that come out, and I'll go back and reference this particular passage to make clear some of the errors that we can clearly see were being taught by other teachers there at Colossae. So it is important for us to understand how this word uh, in the Old Testament may have been used And I would like to show you something. If you'll turn to Exodus. We're going to do a lot of turning in our Bibles today. And I like doing that because it's important. I believe sometimes I say things and, you know, people say, where where is that? What what passage? Well, look it up. (laughs) Don't be lazy. But today I'll I'll do most of the work for you. So Exodus... I want you to read this with me. There's a very interesting passage in Exodus 4 and verse 22. This is when God basically tells Moses that he's going to go to Egypt and stand before Pharaoh. And verse 22 says, this is God speaking to Moses. Thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Now, we know that God will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will not let the people go immediately. But there's an important thing right there. Israel is my son, even my firstborn. God is speaking to Moses, who is going to speak to Pharaoh regarding a nation, and he's calling a nation his firstborn, his prototokos, which is pretty important because if you think about it, it speaks volumes of the way God looked at and perceived the nation of Israel and the children of Israel as special, chosen, singled out, but specifically here, even thy firstborn. So the first of its kind. Now, if we were looking to the history of the people in this book, they were the first of their kind in that God said to Abraham, These people will go in, they will become slaves, they'll come out, they'll be even more rich, and the the rest is history, as they say. But my point here is, God speaking, referencing a whole nation, calling the whole nation firstborn. That Hebrew word, the equivalent, I'll write it out phonetically for you, bekur, which basically carries the meaning that we are understanding, the basic meaning of what we're understanding as in firstborn. But make no mistake that even within the Old Testament, we are going to be looking, as I said, two understandings, natural birth and birthright. And immediately, anybody who's a student, even just a beginner, will remember the passage of Jacob and Esau. And, you know, for some weird reason, it records these two brothers in the womb and records Esau as 
the firstborn. If you, if you study that passage, obviously we know that Jacob, his name being heel catcher and conniver, he manages to get what he wants. Esau sells his birthright for a bowl of pottage or porridge. But it's interesting, if you think about it, that birthright, what would, you know, we, we kind of say, what would it really mean? What would that birthright blessing really mean? Well, all you've got to do is read the, the rest of the book of Genesis to see that God not only promised for that birthright, there's promises attached to that, special blessings attached to that, that even in Jacob's connivingness, he desired that special, we'll call it a blessing or a benediction, not singular. There were multiple things attached to it. So it's important to understand the birthright or the law of primogenitor, which, by the way, we don't and have not used in, in America, but in feudal England, the law of primogenitor was supreme. That meant basically kind of what it meant here for the people of the Bible, the eldest and typically the eldest child being a son, given a double portion of inheritance and upon the father's passing becomes essentially the leader of the family and all the blessings that go with that being firstborn. So uh, we have the same situation, same but different with David's sons. And if you think about it, Solomon was not David's first child. So, but it's Solomon that sits on the throne. It's sought to Solomon that we have interesting birthright privileges without being the firstborn. So you've got a rich history if you study the word. And then, as I said, confusion sets in because if you take the controversy I talked about last week, you can see how if we're not clear about certain words, and I'll tell you what the terms are that get muddied, Firstborn, begotten, only begotten. I mean, there's several of these words that just almost get so mushed around that if Paul wanted, by the way, to say that Jesus was first created, he would have used a different word, because there is a word in the Greek, proto, I hope I write this right, tistos. That would be the word for first and created. He didn't write that. In fact, I'll, I'll take a shortcut right now and kind of cut to the chase, and then we could talk about all the stuff that's in between. If you turn to the book of Hebrews, you can see something that's crystal clear. That's the New Testament, folks. <laughs> if you look, Hebrews 12 and verse 16... And I'll go back and read verse 15 for the sake of fluidity. Looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, for who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. The word there, prototokia. So it's, just the ending that's different. And if, we, if I was going to take the time, I would show you how suffixes can give us enlighten a little bit, but that's a different study. So you can definitely see there, you're not missing a thing when you read black and white right there, birthright. So it is important to understand how diverse and yet narrow... In understanding, there is one example that I'm going to go to first in the New Testament regarding prototokos, which is, we'll call it anomalous. And the reason why it's anomalous is because it refers to natural birth. It's really the only one that you will find with me in Luke. Luke, and I believe it's 2 7. Yep, Luke 2 7. And this is the only one that will speak of a natural birth in a natural way, but it actually has a caveat attached to it. This is regarding the birth of Jesus. 
and Mary, the mother of Jesus. And verse 7 says, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. She brought forth her firstborn son. Now, what's important here is the word prototokos is being used. Firstborn, you can see if you have a Bible like mine, 4416, beside firstborn. But I said caveat. And that is, we must understand the use of this word even here. It does suggest a, and I say natural, there was nothing normal about the birth or the conception and birth of Jesus. Nothing normal at all. But you could see how, again, when you study words, there is the strong ability to eliminate certain errors. So, for example, if Luke, who wrote with precision and used precise words, if he wanted to say, for example, Mary's only child, he would have used the word, the Greek word, monogenes, not prototokos, only born. So when people talk about, and I'm just going to dovetail this in because it's a theological issue, when people talk about Mary's virginity, it's important to understand prototokos here actually is a first of its kind because that never happened before. Have you read anywhere in any historical record or otherwise of a virgin giving birth to a child? It's the first of its kind. Therefore, even though there is the natural element attached, it is still an anomalous use. It's very different. And There's something even more interesting. If you study the record of John the Baptist, who is also the firstborn child in that family, he is not called prototokos. So we begin to see this word as having a connection directly to Messiah, not being used Uh, like the Old Testament, where it had some shades and some directions it could go in, this will kind of tunnel us a little bit more to a point that points directly to Christ. So that's why I mentioned John the Baptist, as I said, firstborn in his family, but not mentioned as prototokos. So let's look at some other examples of this word to see if we can spot and understand its meaning and the shades of meaning. So if you'll turn with me, let's go to Romans 8. We have a very, very interesting use there. And I don't want you to think we're just looking up verses and looking at words. I want you to, as we go, the whole point of this exercise is to understand, as we look at these examples, the shades of meaning that are carried with this word in its use where it appears. So Romans 8 and verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So there, self-explanatory, we're showing that word, firstborn, prototokos, as to show the highest rank that belongs to Jesus, his position in relation to the church that is being spoken of here, firstborn among many brethren. We have a similar example in Colossians 1.18, where the word is going to be used again, and that's also remarkable that in that close of a, between 1.15 and 1.18, so in 1.15, firstborn of every creature, in 1.18, Colossians 1.18, firstborn of from the dead. And of course, I think that one has clarity to it. This passage is referring to the resurrection and his relationship to the church. This passage can be directly linked to, because it's saying the same thing, to Revelation 1, and I believe verse 5. Let's take a look at that. Yep. So it says, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead. You have the same concept that is here. First of his kind. 
And this concept, by the way, of first of his kind, is directly attached to the concept of first fruit. You know, you read many times in the Bible where it says Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection. Well, think of that in terms of a harvest. The first portion of the harvest suggests the whole harvest in view. So sometimes when we read or we look, we're only looking at the first portion of the harvest, which is Christ, and we fail to understand this first portion of the harvest says you cannot forget the whole harvest, and the whole harvest will be fulfilled in the culmination of the age when the whole harvest of human souls of all times, not just in the now, in the past, in the now, and in the future, that culmination of the harvest of souls, which when we talk about, for example, the day of Pentecost, began, that started the harvest of souls, but will only be finished, quite frankly, that that harvest, the final harvest, will be from the 144,000 preachers of righteousness. That will be the final harvest on earth for anyone who hears the gospel message preached and responds. So what can we take away from this, uh, at least here? The specific thing I want to point out to you, first born from the dead, he's the first of his kind. And a lot of people make this mistake in homogenizing all the people in the Bible who have been raised from the dead, and there are several. But most people, when they go to the New Testament, they think Lazarus. Well, Lazarus wasn't the firstborn from the dead because he still had to die again. He wasn't raised up and then permanently resurrected on earth. He still had to die. He was brought forth out of the tomb to put basically the power of God on display to show something to these two sisters to make them understand that, yes, we all will be raised up at the last day, but the power that Jesus had was the ability to raise the dead. And he did just that. But make no mistake, firstborn from the dead is the first of his kind, and Jesus was the first of his kind in the resurrection in that in raising up from the dead, he dies no more. Now, I just I want to stop there for a second because we live in a society that is so replete with fear. We're, we're crammed with this idea of being scared and being afraid and specifically of death and dying. You know, if you're a Christian and if you're studying this book, at some point, especially if you're just kind of starting off, for people who have been studying this word for a long time, it should be in you and you should be clear about it. There's a lot of people out there, they're just starting the journey, and they still cannot talk about death and dying. Now listen to me, this is what separates Christians from non-Christians. And this is, this is part of the lesson, whether you like it or not. This is what separates, you know, people say, oh, I'm a Christian, and then you talk to them about death and dying, oh, no, no, I can't talk about that, I'm scared, I'm afraid. Okay, hold on a second. If you really believe what's in this book, and I just told you, he's the first of his kind, and we've used terms like prototokos, which is really a term related to Messiah in the New Testament, and he is the first of his kind. And he says, for faith in him, we shall be like him. Then, and I'm going to use the word, then why the hell are you afraid? You either faith and believe and trust that this is true or you don't and there's nothing in between and for those people I'm going to speak to those people who have not settled this issue because I can tell you as a pastor but more specifically as a Christian I have talked to more people who and listen I'm not a stoic over over 15 years but more specifically over 25 years of being here And I have had many brothers and sisters, many of the familiar faces that you all know that have been promoted. Now, if I were to remove my faith for a minute and step out of that faith connection, I think I would be miserable inside. It's almost like I, I too, await that day, and I await it with dread, and I don't want to talk about it, I'm fearful about it, and I worry about it. Or 
I actually have come to the reality that Jesus has taken the sting of death away. It means I will still die and you will still die. But because of my faith in him, I too and you too will be raised up at the last day, absent from the body, present with the Lord. And this is something that if you are still working on this, please, for the benefit of your sanity and your salvation, there are messages that play on the network regarding the proof or proofs of the resurrection. That, that, that means when I hear people talking about, I'm scared, I'm afraid, I don't want to talk about it, I can't hear it, means you have not wrapped your mind around the resurrected Christ. You have not wrapped your mind around the fact that he did die. He said he would raise up. He was raised up on the third day. He appeared to many. He ascended. He's coming back. Failure to grab hold of that, of course, that's going to lead to people not understanding and being worried and concerned. And I, I, I don't, I, I've heard, I've, people have said to me, well, that's great for you. No, it's great for you too. It's not just about what I think. It's about what this word says that gives me the assurance, especially as I get older. I think to myself, you know, when I was in my 20s or 30s, I never thought about being in my 50s. I never thought about, there's a lot of things. When you're 20 or 30, all you think about is, uh, ah, I'm here. (laughs) (laughs) Ha ha, aren't you lucky, right? (laughs) Golly gee, if I didn't have the faith that I have and the understanding that I have, I would be miserable. I would be distraught. I'd be waiting for the guillotine for me too and you too. But I have this blessed hope that's really not just put in a box hope. It is the reality of what I've come to know about Jesus Christ. And it's not subjective, I think thus. It is over and over and over and over repeated in this book. So when we talk about firstborn from the dead, that never happened in this way before, and he basically set the tone for the rest of the harvest to happen in that way. We, too, will be part of that group of people. And there's only one criteria that we keep trusting and faithing in him. So... What else do we have? We have a little bit more here. There is a section I want to go to that kind of puts it all in a different perspective. That's out of the book of Hebrews, which I took you there, but we're going to go back there again. Hebrews, and we're going to be, I think we're going to start, actually we're going to look at a couple of passages here. We're first going to start in the beginning of the book, because the beginning of the book, first chapter, has basically a little bit of a mirror to the passages we've looked at out of Colossians. That's why I said if, you, if you're reading the Bible and you're studying it, you're going to see repeatables, and that's what we measure on here. We, we work on God's repeatables. So to not do too much despite to the text, I'm going to read from verse 1 and all the way down to about verse 12. So bear with me. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake, In time past, under the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. You see, there is my repeatable once more, by whom also he made the worlds. That's the same thing that is being spoken of in Colossians, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. Didn't we just study that? And upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Inheritance, prototokos. We have another attached concept, inheritance, and this word for firstborn. They go together. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Now that word for begotten is a completely different Greek word, geneo. That is begotten in the sense of to birth. We get our word for genesis from that word. The genesis, get our word basically of origins, genitals, from this word. 
And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And this is a direct quote out of Psalm 2-7, which if you go back and read that, it's almost mind-boggling. Some of these psalms that are messianic, that speak of Christ back there when Christ was not yet in the flesh, and attributed first perhaps to David, but then in the greater picture when you read on, you know that it's, it, it speaks of something much greater than David. So he says, And I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth, when he bringeth in the first begotten, here we have our word now, not firstborn, but first begotten. If you have a Bible like mine, it'll say 4416 beside it. Why? Because that is prototokos into the world. So when he brought his first begotten, his prototokos into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Now, let me say a sidebar, because we'll end up using this text eventually to combat the heresy that we know that Paul was combating to the church at Colossae and possibly also the church at Laodicea, which is a form of angel worship, making the angels greater and more important than Jesus or the Father. So it's important to read this in perspective when he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his, and his ministers a flame of fire? But unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever And ever, a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness, hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they shall wax old, as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels saith he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies footstool? So it's basically, again, showing the greatness of Christ over all. And that's the, the wonder when I say to you, you can put text on top of text on top of text. There you have doctrine. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to tell you is, when we look at this word, prototokos, you've got to consider all the places it occurs and what exactly is it conveying. And here I can tell you unequivocally, except for the passage I referenced out of Luke 2 7, which spoke of Mary bringing forth the child in a natural way, if you will, all of these other references have to do more with birthright, inheritance first fruits, they have something of Christ, which is the first of his kind, and as we follow him, we too shall be like him. This is the important part. Now, I could add to the mix and make you really confused by telling you that there, there's other titles that sound a lot the same. For example, in John 1.14, you have the only begotten of the Father. John 1.18, the only begotten Son, John 3.16, his, his only begotten Son. John 3.18, the only begotten Son of God. And I could keep going on. In fact, and I just read here in verse 5 when it says, of which of the angels at any time did he say, this day I have begotten thee? And then I asked the question, because it needs to be asked. When he says here, he, when, again, when he bringeth forth, he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, This idea cannot be understood as Jesus as created. It cannot be understood as Jesus in a natural way, but must be understood each and every time as unique to his kind. Like in the Old Testament when it said, for example, so-and-so of Pharaoh's house that came out of Pharaoh's house, the likeness, keeping the same ceremonies, the same rituals. We could say the same thing of Christ, of what comes of Christ, but in his case, it's always a first. And when we follow, we shall be of, basically, the genitive following and produced out of what came first. This is an important lesson. When 
we get into, and I'll take you back to close out the message, back into Colossians. When we get into a little bit further examination of our text, it's very important to not lose sight of these few verses. For example, if you go back to verse 16 when it says, all things created in heaven, in earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, all created by him. He is the agent of creation. You go back to the beginning of John, which says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, or in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. All of these speak of the same concept. To remove this concept is to remove the greatness, the supremacy, the preeminence that Christ has over all and in all. So I'm going to ask you a question, which I believe is a good question to ask at this point. Um, don't, don't laugh at me, because, you know, a lot of times you hear evangelists ask questions, and they're designed to basically fill up the uh, altar call. I'm not doing that. I'm asking you to reflect on something I'm going to ask you. Do you, when you think of Jesus, do you think of Jesus in your life as the first of his kind and you being attached to him by faith? Do you see yourself as following after him in that same way? This is important because I think if you can't answer that question as yes, you almost need to go back and do a little bit more work on filling out the gray areas of the resurrection if it's not clear. This is an important question, so I'll ask it again. What place does Christ have in your life? This is not a, oh, I'm going to make a decision for Christ. This is to try and understand, is he creator over all, in all, by all, for himself, and basically that being he chose you for him, therefore operating in you to bring forth a result? Or are you just kind of like somebody who's on a production line and you're just going along with the conveyor belt not understanding what you've been chosen into? It's it's something rhetorical for you to think and consider because if I'm reading the text aright and he is the first of his kind over every creature and over all of creation and last time I checked, we're a part of his creation then the, the answer to the question should be yes. But I can't answer that for you. Only you can answer that for you. And if the answer is not yes, I'm not telling you, oh my God, it's a train wreck. I'm telling you that you need to go back and do a little work in trying to get better and greater clarity because the way I read this, for by him were all things created. Are you part of the all things? I'm part of the all things, all things, all things could be everything in heaven, in earth, visible, invisible. We'll call them the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? All, all made by him, and he's before all things, and by him all things consist. He's the head of the body, the church. It means even this. I, I could go off on this one thing when it says he's the head of the body, the church, If you're in a church and Jesus is not being proclaimed as the head of the church, and if you're in a church and you're not being taught that he is the head, the church is the body, but more specifically the church, what is the church? The church is the ecclesia of God, the out called, ek out called, ecclesia, ones of God, belonging to him now. Very important to get clarity on this, that if he is the head of the church, and he is the firstborn of those, basically first of his kind to be risen up, to be raised up from the dead, and we are part of that out-called body, then we too shall follow him. And I'm going to keep driving this point for the next few minutes to say that is part of the problem. When people go into a church and they think the church is an entertainment place, there's no worse tragedy than going into the place that is called by God, God's people that should have God's word written on their heart 
and all that you see or you hear is vacancy, void of the word, void of anything that can make you and I understand that this here tells me one thing. You know, you hear the expression, is Jesus Lord of your life? I, I can't stand the evangelist trying to, like a slithering snake, work their way in, but not for the right reason. It's always that kind of got you, and then, you know, you've heard the hang another scalp on the belt. Well, you know, it's a, a three point seven million saved here, like a McDonald's drive through, rather than I don't know and I don't have the capacity to know who is saved and who is not. That is God's responsibility. And anyone who can put a number, I, you, you would, I'm sure you're all well aware of uh, some of these ministries that do that. They put a number on how many people have been saved through their ministry. Well, friends, if you're part of that group, I can't help you, and i got nothing to say to you because I have no way of knowing, and you have no way of knowing. But what you can know is about your business. You can know about your connection to Christ and your understanding to who he is in your life and how that works by this word prototokos is kind of a radical thing for me and that's what I, I'm going to close with this. It is my prayer for people who are not yet understanding. When I talk about the largeness, the greatness, the magnitude of what we're dealing with in these few verses that tells me, you know, in the times when I think I'm alone, or I'm navigating this whole ship by myself, I'm reminded when I read these passages that if all things were created by him, I'm a part, a key component of his creation, functioning in the machine that he created, I'm using the term that way, as part of a whole body. Think of a computer, all the components have to work together. There can only be one operator, one person who's basically typing in the keys and giving the orders. That's Christ. But all the components work together, supposedly. That's the way it should be. Uh, yikes. All right, now we have to go to another message, which is... Uh, <laughs> but you understand my point. So if, if we understand the picture that I've just painted that everything's supposed to work together and that there's one author, there's one architect, there's one person who's basically driving the bus, then you're either in the bus. I went from a computer to a bus because now it makes more sense. You're either in the bus and you're with him or you're still standing on the curb. And for the people still standing on the curb, I'm just going to tell you something. There's a reason why you're listening today there's a reason why. I can't, I, I'm not going to try and explain or try and say this or that. I'm just going to say there's a reason why. And if you stick around and you keep tuning in, maybe the reason will become more and more clear. Maybe it's because God wants you. And it's, it's much easier for us to rationalize. And we do that so well. God doesn't want me or I'm not good enough or I've been too bad, or I, I, it's too late, or I'm too old, or I'm too whatever. And God probably is saying, shut up already. <laughs> I spoke to you through my son. Now you either accept, rejoice, get happy over it, or you'll be waiting on the curb for a long, long time because the bus is taking off. Wait a minute. Let's go from the bus to the train. The train is leaving the station. Computer, bus, train, I don't care how you look at it, but see, here's the tragedy. I can't make people accept and embrace what I've just spent the last 40 minutes talking about. I can't make people get excited about it. The thing that excites me, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I'm very grateful for opportunities, but these these days we live in, it's not as though, I, I don't know, does anybody get up in the morning and go, oh, wow, I'm so happy. Do you get up like that these days? I don't think so. Most people get up and it's like, oh, God, not again. <laughs> I mean, what, I'm still here? But what I'm trying to say is it makes every day's privilege of getting another day a greater blessing if it is to draw closer to him grow in our understanding, and more importantly, settle something once and for all. And that is, if 
He is the firstborn of every creature. And if he is the firstborn from the dead, then I am in good hands and you're in good hands because the pattern that he set is one that is crystal clear. He told Mary and Martha this truth about the resurrection when he said, whoever believes in me shall have life eternal. Well, the passages that I'm looking at, these words that I'm looking at make clear the pattern that he made is for those who follow him by faith. So I'm going to keep following by faith. I'm going to keep pressing on. And I'm going to keep preaching to people, whether you listen to me or not, whether you believe me or not. I'm not asking you to believe me. I am asking you to believe God and take him at his word. And I'm also telling you, the wonderful thing is, if you start getting in and you start doing a little investigative work into the scripture, you're going to find more and more that you're going to be leaning towards the impossibility, the improbability, that there is nothing else, no greater thing than to read and recognize that Christ called you, he chose you, and he has something planned for you outside of the now. That connected to his being prototokos, the first of his kind, gives me the great assurance that no matter what this life brings, no matter what, I am going to be with him. You are going to be with him. There's just one criteria and one only, that you keep the faith. That's what I plan to do. I hope you plan to do it as well. Keep the faith, friends. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.